Good evening. God bless you. And thank you for joining us here at Calvary Grace. This is our Tuesday night Bible study. And we're in the seventh, pardon me, sixth session of the study on the millennium. The first week we looked at the scepter of the king and the fact that he will carry the scepter of a king. And you can track that all the way from Genesis all the way to Revelation. The next one was the iron rod. It appears that when he takes the throne, which most believers have prayed for. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Well, when he takes the throne, there will be those that do not want that and that will fight back against him. And so he's also not just portrayed as having the scepter of a king, but he's also portrayed very strongly as having an iron rod. Iron at the time was the hardest known metal. And it's a way of saying my way or the highway. Then we went on to Satan being bound and Satan will be bound for that thousand year period. A lot of people wonder why God would let him loose at the end of the thousand year period. And that's what we covered in that particular study. Then we looked at Gog and Magog. And in Gog and Magog, we looked at this statement that draws our attention back to Ezekiel, I believe, 38, where you have this war which we believe is the war of Armageddon. But that happens at the beginning of the tribulation, pardon me, at the end of the tribulation, the beginning of the millennium. When we come to the Gog and Magog story that happens in Revelation chapter 20, we're now past the millennium and we're moving on through now into another period of time. And so there's a war that's going to transpire where all of the evil forces that Satan could round up around the world when he's let out will come down on Israel and specifically on Jerusalem, the holy city. And God with literally thunder and lightning will destroy them all, will wipe them all out with fire that falls from heaven. I think that's what we would call lightning. The net effect will be that those that have resisted and continue to resist will be utterly wiped out and destroyed. And those that will go on into the final kingdom will be believers only. Well, we come now to a portion in Revelation chapter 20 that is kind of pregnant with meaning. It's very, very interesting. I'm going to read Revelation 20 again. I think I've read it every week so far. Why not tonight? Take your Bibles, turn to Revelation 20 verse 1. And here's what it says. I saw an angel coming down out of heaven. Again, I just want to reiterate here, this is not Jesus. As a matter of fact, we don't even know that it's an archangel. It's just an angel. God can give authority to whoever he wants in any amount. I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. Have you ever watched The Dog Whisperer? If you haven't, you absolutely should. Every Christian should watch it. It is a brilliant show. And it's really brilliant because it teaches you that the problem with animals is usually humans. And when he gets into the cage with an absolute, absolutely vicious animal, within a few minutes, that animal's his best friend. It is truly a remarkable thing to see. But he steps in there with not a chain in this case, but usually a leash of some kind that he will slip around the throat of that dog. And he will control that dog without harming or hurting that dog. I see that happening here. There's an angel coming down out of heaven with a chain in his hand. And he is going to round up the devil. Now how that works, I don't know. I say that because the devil is a spirit. He doesn't have flesh and blood as you have. And so this chain must be some sort of spiritual binding or bonding, which has the ability to wrestle this devil down. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years had ended. After that time, he must be set free for a short time. And we talked about why that would be. So we'll carry on. Verse 4, I saw thrones, 
uh, on which were seated those that had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls that had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and did not receive his mark in their foreheads or in their hands. And they came to life and they reigned for a thousand with Christ for a thousand years. So this is the very beginning now of the millennium. They're coming to life. They're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead. Now, there's a very pregnant passage. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were over. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those that have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they are priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years is over, Satan will be released from prison and go out and deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they're like the sand of the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had also been thrown. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And then I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead in it, the dead, and, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Well, the point of our passage tonight, well, the point that I want to deal with tonight is this. You find it in verse, oh, we'll start at, say, verse 4. I saw thrones on which were seated those that had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those that had been beheaded because of the te their testimony for Jesus and the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And here it is. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those that have part in the first resurrection. Well, you know, when I was growing up, I was a kid, and I would hear about these resurrections from the dead. didn't mean too much to me. I was a kid. But I, 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 I never assumed there'd be more than one. Why is he saying, blessed and holy are those that have part in the first resurrection? Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 5, verse 26 for a moment. John 5, 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge, because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to life, and those that have done evil will rise to be condemned. Now, I want you to look at the words here that Jesus uses. I'm reading the 1984 edition of the NIV, but it's very much the same in any translation. Those who have done. Those who have done. You see, Jesus, being Jewish, came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And so he lives to the law exactly. 
He teaches as a rabbi under the law. And when he teaches, his teaching is rabbinical teaching. It's based on the Old Testament law. And so it's a works-based system. When we come to the New Testament and the teachings of Paul, it's a belief-based system. And even finally, Jesus himself will say, those that believe in me will have everlasting life. We know it is not by our works that we're saved. In fact, I would dare say we're saved in spite of our works. But when it comes to these people, they will be judged by their works. Watch now. Come with me to Daniel chapter 12 for a moment. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And it says, at that time, Michael, the great prince, and by the way, that is Michael, the archangel, who protects your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone, whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting shame. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever. Here's how it seems to shake out as far as I can tell. There is a resurrection that takes place for Old Testament saints and for the unbelieving in the Old Testament. And they will face the Obima, the great white throne judgment. And the books will be opened. And they will be judged according to their works, because the law was works-based. But that's the second resurrection. There's a first resurrection. And it starts a little bit earlier on. In Daniel, pardon me, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. We read of some confusion going on about the resurrection. By the way, there's only one rapture, but there are several comings of the Lord. He will come back for his church, that's the rapture. He will come back at the end of the tribulation, that's the return of the Lord. And so you have two that often get confused. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, keep reminding these, them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It's of no value. It only ruins those that listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter, because those that (coughs) indulge in it become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them was Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have wandered from the truth. They say the resurrection has already taken place. And they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed within the inscription. The Lord knows who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. They say the resurrection's already taken place. Well, how could they say that? These two individuals, let's say gentlemen, probably not gentlemen, these two individuals have come into the church and said, oh, resurrection, yes. That's already happened, you know. You've missed it. Well, that's the core of our faith. That's the center of our faith. The fact that when we die, we will inherit eternal life. We will be raised from the dead, and not spiritually. We're not coming back as a bunch of wonderful ghosts. We're coming back in physical bodies that will be like his. First John tells us when we see him, we'll be like him. He walked on water. 
He did miracles. He walked through walls. He did all kinds of amazing and wonderful things, and we will be like him. So there will be a change in us. We'll deal with that in a few moments. But here is these individuals, and they've come along, and they're literally destroying the faith of people by saying, oh, the resurrection's already happened. And you know what? They weren't wrong. They absolutely were not wrong. Well, not entirely wrong. They were mostly wrong, but not entirely wrong. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew 27, verse 46. And let me show you this. Matthew 27, verse 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then some of standing there heard this. They said, <laughs> he's calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, and he filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now let's leave him and see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. And they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection. And they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And when the centurion and those that were with him were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely this was the Son of God. So clearly that story got out. Even in the first century, clearly, they, and believe it or not, they didn't have email. That story got out. And so there was these two men that got a hold of that and went, oh, yeah, we've, the resurrection's already happened. No big deal, by the way. It, it was nothing. It was just a few, few that came out of the tombs after Jesus died. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's over. It's done. You've missed the resurrection. Well, then wh wh why are we joining the, the Christian faith? Oh, well, it makes a better person. No, it doesn't. If you know Christians... We are forgiven. We're not better. Right. We're on the way to better. We hope to get better. Yeah. We're trying for better. Amen. But believe me, we're better than nobody. Amen. All we are is forgiven. And so as we study through this, we realize there was a res resurrection, which they may have been talking about. And yet Paul makes it very clear that it's wrong teaching, that they're not right that this is not what he's referring to, and don't listen to these guys. Don't follow into that. Take your Bibles and turn to John 11, verse 17 for a moment. John eleven seventeen. 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. I have personal experience with this. Part of our family is Jewish. And if you've ever been to a Jewish funeral, you would understand what this means. But they do a thing called sitting shiva. And they actually sell cardboard boxes which come flat and you construct them into a box. And they cover all the mirrors in the house. And then they sit on these boxes, not allowed to sit in a comfortable chair. And for 30 days, they sit shiver and they mourn. They don't cook. They don't look in the mirror. They don't bath. They either sleep or sit on the box. And the community now rallies around and brings food and provides and looks after them for 30 full days. 
Mary and Martha are supposed to be sitting Shiva, and the community is gathering around them just exactly as it should happen. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. And right there, if you're Jewish, you know there's a problem. She should not be getting up and going out. But Mary stayed home. Mary, very Jewish, she sat Shiva. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I know. Even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will. Again, at the resurrection on the last day. Again, notice the term, the last day. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, Lazarus believed in him, and he's dead. Mary and Martha believed in him. I don't think they're around. The disciples are all gone. So what is he talking about here? He's talking about the fact that he has granted them eternal life, and though they appear to die physically, they are not dead. They're alive. And by the way, when a human being dies, he does not become an angel. Get rid of that thought. That is a secular thought. It has nothing to do with the Christian faith. That's absolute nonsense. Angels are a separate phylum, a separate class altogether. And there are classes within the angels. A human being, when they die, becomes a spirit. And the spirit and the soul goes back to God who gave it. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And no, they're not visiting you on weekends. Verse 27, yes, Lord, he told me. Nope, she told him, I believe that you are the Mashiach, the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And so, as you know, the Lord would go and he would raise Lazarus from the dead. And then a few days later, he would die. And three days after that, he would raise from the dead. We're dealing with separate resurrections here. One is going to be for the church. It's the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those that are part of the first resurrection. The second will be Old Testament saints, according to Daniel. Both saints and sinners. And they will be judged after the millennium. The thousand-year rule of Christ, or reign of Christ. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, we read this. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone that does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life. And he that does not have the Son of God does not have life. We live in a world of people that reject Christ. And according to this passage, they are going to hell. Is that something I take joy of? Absolutely not. I, do, I, I don't think that any right-minded human being should take joy over that kind of thing. This is a terrible and a tormenting thing. But we should take joy in the fact that we know Christ and we are saved. And he has granted you eternal life. Will you physically die? Yes. Some of you look half dead tonight. We've just come through the time change. We're all exhausted. Believe me, we will all physically snuff it. The time comes for every man. Death and taxes. But with that in mind... There's a difference between when a believer dies and an unbeliever dies. The book of Luke records that, incidentally. When the believer died, the angels were there to spirit him away. When the unbeliever died, he was simply buried. It was a picture of him going down into the grave, whereas the believer was spirited away by the angels. It's the story of the rich man and the beggar. 
Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12 for a moment. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. If it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can you say, some of you say, there's no resurrection of the dead? Now, very clearly what's happening here is Paul is preaching to a people that are a mixed group and they have Sadducees amongst them. The Sadducees believed today like liberal Christians. Liberal Christians take the Bible seriously, but not literally. And anybody that applies it today is, well, you know, square or crazy or some sort of fanatic. The liberal Christians believe that much of what the Bible says is just allegorical. That it's a good story, that it's, it's meant to make us better people. Whereas the conservative Christians believe that it's literal, that hell is real that heaven is real, that resurrection is real, that we will all die and one day Christ will come and wake us up. That's our point of view. There are many, many that the church, in fact, I know of churches not far from here where at their, at their meetings they'll have a witch get up and speak. They'll have a warlock get up and speak. They'll have uh, 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 a shaman get up and speak. Anybody that has any kind of spiritual bend, and by the way, watch out for spiritual people, because just being spiritual is not enough. There are lots of spirits out there you don't want to have contact with. With that in mind, some of them in this audience, in the Bible here, were Sadducees. And the Sadducees, being the liberal Jews of the time, believed there was no resurrection of the dead, no miracles. You know, somewhere in the late 1970s, I think early 1980s, Reader's Digest decided to put out a Bible. And so to put out their Bible, they went through and they took out the miracles because obviously none of that really happened. Well, go and see if you can buy one of their Bibles now. Turns out nobody believed it, nobody wanted it, and you can't take the miracles out of the Bible, who are you to edit it? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised from the dead. And if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Just think about that. If this entire theory of resurrection, if this entire concept of resurrection is somehow flawed or faulty or doesn't really exist, <laughs> What are you doing following Christ? Go out, eat, drink, and be merry. Do whatever you want, because without this, there's no power to our faith. And if Christ hasn't been our, uh, raised from the dead, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we're found to be false witnesses about God, for we testify about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead aren't raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. That's how important the resurrection is. If Jesus just died, well, what's the difference between that and my uncle that died? What's the difference between that and, 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 and any of our families that have died? They died. They're buried. The difference is he rose again. And more importantly, he rose never to die again. Watch. Then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those that have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also came through a man. By the way, you might notice it doesn't say death came through a woman, but a man. Why is that? 
Because if Eve had eaten the fruit, and no, it wasn't an apple. We don't know what it was. If Eve had eaten the fruit alone, she would have died. Time would have come. She would have aged out and died. And God would have provided another mate for Adam. But when Adam ate the fruit, you now had a fallen pair capable of reproduction. And from them came a fallen race. We call it the human race. So the Bible doesn't blame Eve here. It blames Adam. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also came through a man. For as in Adam, see it's not Eve, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all are made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, and then when he comes, those that belong to him. Then the end will come, and he will hand the kingdom of God, uh, pardon me, kingdom to God, the Father, <coughs> after he has destroyed the dominion, uh, authority, and all dominion, authority, and power. But he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed will be death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says everything has been put under him, it's clear it doesn't mean God himself who put everything under Christ. And when he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who has put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Now, if there's no resurrection, what about those who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why, do people, why are people baptized for them? By the way, this was a cultic practice of the time. And Paul is just pointing it out. Look, you, you bunch, you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, but you run around baptizing in the name of the dead. It's still done today by a number of cults, a number of groups still baptized for the dead. The idea is so-and-so has died, and I don't think they were right with God, so let's go get baptized for them. When your number's up, your number's up, and you'd better be ready. As for us, why do we endanger ourselves in every hour? I die daily. I mean that, brothers, surely, just as surely as the glory, I glory over Christ Jesus our Lord. I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons. What have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let's eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. His entire argument here is, there is a resurrection coming. It is the point to our faith. You know, many years ago, I know some of you are old-time Christians. You know what I'm talking about. We sang so much about heaven. We sang so much about being raised from the dead. So many songs that were part of the faith, which have slipped away for more emotional, heart-pulling type songs, which is a grand shame. Jump down to verse 34, or verse 35. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? Come on, yeah, you're talking this resurrection thing. Don't, don't be, st how, how is it possible to raise the dead? What kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And when you sow, you don't plant the body that will be, but a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives a body as he's determined, and each kind of seed gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds and fish have another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another kind. The sun has one kind of splendor, and the moon has another, and the stars another. And stars differ in splendor. So it will be at the resurrection. The body that is sown is perishable. Boy, I'll tell you. I take a lot of vitamins. I take a lot of vitamins. Because I'm well aware that I'm perishable and perishing. I may have lost some hair over the years. It's possible. 
you become aware of these things. And it's true, the body that we live in here is perishing. You get to about 18, and you got the world by the tail. By about 28, eh, maybe not so much. By 38, definitely not. By 40, lordy, lordy, look who's turning 40. And she's downhill fast. Well, it's sown in dishonor. The body that's sown is perishable, but it's raised imperishable. That's such good news. What's coming next is not a body that can have a sore back or a sore neck. All the things that you've had cut out will be put back in. I get my gallbladder back, I'll be thrilled. There are remarkable things that are going to happen. It says it's raised in glo- it's sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, and raised in power. Sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was sown, pardon me, the first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those that are of the earth. As is the man from heaven, so also are those that are from heaven. And just as we are, have borne the likeness of the earthly man, in other words, we all look like Adam and Eve did. So shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. In other words, we are going to be like him when we see him. Exactly as John would say in 1 John, when we see him, we'll be like him. We'll bear a likeness. We'll have a glorified body. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, praise God. I'm so glad for that. Could you imagine going up there in the state you're in right now? For all eternity? If God were to just stop your aging right here, right now, and you could carry on like this for a billion years, you'd have to go up with a fistful of Tylenol. But God has a better plan. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. Dr. Hawking, my friend and mentor, not a well man at the moment, but a tremendous influence into my life, Dr. Hawking, put that on the door of their children's Sundays, uh, their children's nursery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In the flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come to death has been swallowed up in victory. When you get your new body, you will never have to worry about dying again. Drugstores are going to go broke. Hospitals will be empty because you won't get sick. You won't need meds anymore. Where, O death, is your victory and where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Take your Bibles and turn real quickly to 1 Thessalonians 4.13. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant about those that have fallen asleep or to grieve like the rest of men that have no hope. Over the last couple of years, I have buried some of the closest people to me in my life. 
including my parents. And the way that I dealt with that was to come to the understanding that they had merely gone on ahead and to realize that my father now knew I was right on so many things. He and I had theological differences and arguments at times. He now knows I was right. Brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant about those that have fallen asleep or grieve like the rest of the men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those that have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own words, I tell you that we who are still alive and who are left at the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those that have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command or loud, uh, with a loud shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, we're getting to the point for this evening. The first resurrection. The dead in Christ will rise first. Here it is. The first resurrection starts at the rapture of the church. It ends when those that have died during the tribulation, being martyred, are raised. And it's considered, they're considered to be part of the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those that have part in the first resurrection. Well, here's where the first resurrection starts. You know, you can walk into a church service at the beginning, the middle, or the end, and it's still the same church service. And the same thing happens here. This rapture, or this, pardon me, this resurrection, is over a period of time. And it's the resurrection of believers, not unbelievers. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now that's quite different to the returning of the Lord at the end of the tribulation. When he comes back, there's no more meeting him in the air. He's coming back to make war. You find him coming back on a white horse. You find him coming from Basra with his clothes stained red. And you find the people standing there saying, who is this coming from Basra with his clothes stained red like you've been treading out the wine press? And he said, it's I, the Lord. There's no one to help me, so I've done it myself. And he will start literally in Basra, which we know today is Jordan. He will start there and he will march down towards Jerusalem and he will be taking out the various armies. The blood, they say, will be to the bridle of the horses. He will be covered. He will arrive into Jerusalem and there the city itself will have tremendous physical changes as he goes up and he takes his seat on the throne. It is going to be the most remarkable time in history this millennium. Therefore, Encourage one another with these words. Well, there's a kind of an interesting passage in Ezekiel. We're running out of time, but it's interesting. Take your Bibles and turn to Ezekiel 37 for a moment. There are many ethnic groups who bury their dead and go back a year or so later to wash the bones. This is not something we do. Praise God. I don't think I would have the stomach for it. But this is not an uncommon practice. It's done amongst the Greeks, done amongst the Italians, it's done amongst many people will do this. They will go back a year later and wash the bones. Clearly not done in this country but done overseas. How then is God going to bring these things back to life? Can these bones live? There's no living DNA. And by the way, I might do one week on the book of life because we now believe we understand what that might be. In fact, I'll tell you, since we have discovered DNA, 
it seems likely that the book of life is your genetic code. Not you specifically, but human beings. God has the genetic code of every human being that's ever lived. And I believe that's what's in the book of life. Along with the things that you've done. And with that genetic code, he can call your body as it is now, or as it was then, or as it will be, into being. That's for another time. Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. They'd been dead a long time. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. And then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. And I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. And I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. And then you'll know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise and a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, and there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy the breath, prophesy, son of men, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come, four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied, as he commanded, and breath entered them, and they came to life, and stood on their feet, a vast army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried and our hope is gone. We're cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And then my people will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. And I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land, and you will know that I am the Lord who has spoken. And I have done it, declares the Lord. There is a first resurrection. It starts with the rapture of the church. It ends with the resurrection of the martyrs, who have been slain during the tribulation who have not taken the mark of the beast and have resisted the system that will be. And blessed and holy are those that have part in that resurrection. The second resurrection will be the, the resurrection of both the good and the bad throughout time itself. And they will be judged not according to what they have believed, but according to what they have done. They will be judged according to the book of life and other books, the Bible says. And some will go on to shine like the stars of heaven, and some will go on to everlasting shame and destruction. Serve the Lord. We are they who believe that the word of God is correct. For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, that's the second death, but have everlasting life. Will you bow your heads? Precious Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have secured our place. Not based on our behavior, but based on your word. Based on Jesus' final works. Lord, when he said it is finished, it was finished. And as we believe in him and endeavor to walk as he did, 
you will grant us eternal life. Lord, in Jesus' name, let us not live down to the lowest possible common denominator, but live to the highest standard. Live up to what we are, Christians, men and women that have been forgiven. May we have part in the first resurrection and be there to serve throughout that entire millennial period. For your word says we will rule and reign with him. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.